You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Gold, crude oil, corn, soybeans, and more. With so many tradable products, the futures options market can be an intimidating place. How can you possibly keep track of the latest trading developments across so many different products? Don't worry, we've got you covered. Welcome to This Week in Futures Options, the program designed to help active futures options traders stay on top of this ever-changing marketplace. Each week, we'll break down the top trades, hot products, volatility explosions, and much more. So be sure to check out our live stream via the Mixler app. Or join our live chat room at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. Whether you're an experienced veteran or a newcomer looking to separate the wheat from the lean hogs, this week in Futures Options has the information you can't find anywhere else. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by Quick Strike, options pricing and analysis software. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. Visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com. And now, get ready to break down the latest futures options trading activity. It's time for This Week in Futures Options. All right, everybody, that music can mean only one thing. It is time once again for TWIFO, This Week in Futures Options, the program where we break down what's going on on the other side of the screen there. So moving on out into some commodity options, equity options getting in there too, of course. We talk energy, you name it. If it's lighting it up, the CME tape, we're talking about it here. My name is Mark Longo from TheOptionsInsider.com, as well as, of course, from the ever-exciting The Options Insider Radio Network. If I sound a wee bit different, it's because I'm coming to you not from our studio in Chicago this week, but actually from the Securities Traders Association Market Structure Conference. I dare you to say that five times fast here in scenic and unseasonably warm D.C. It's like 95 degrees down here <laughs> this week, which is kind of crazy. But we're down here doing a nice deep dive into all things equities. A lot of options going on here as well, as well as some others, some surprise guests coming through our studio here this week, listeners, including one who will be joining us in the CME group hot seat in a little bit. I was very surprised to see him down here. So that was, uh, that was a fun, fun little change. So we'll be tossing to that in a little bit. But in the height of ironies, listeners, usually he's the one who's Somewhere far flung in the far reaches of Asia or in Europe or across the continent. Today, he's the one in Chicago, and I'm the one beaming in. Mr. Sean Smith, the managing director of derivatives licensing over there at FTSE Russell. Sean, welcome back to the TWIFO program. Two weeks in a row, sir. To what do we owe the honor? You know, I'm in town, so you're, I, don't, I don't get it. I come into town, you leave town. It's uh, beginning to, beginning to uh, get a little bit of a complex. But no, uh, it's good to always good to be on the show, Mark. And as you know, I'm always excited to be here because uh, TWIFO is a, a, a program near and dear to my heart. And uh, we got lots going on in Russell World, so FTSE Russell World, I should uh, correct myself. <laughs> 
don't know, Sean, you won't take the hint. You know, I get the heck out of Dodge. Uh, you know, I make sure we, we strategically record when you're not in the city. You, you won't take the hint, sir. No, I won't. I refuse. I'm, I, 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 stay, uh, I stay loyal and enjoy the show too much. <laughs> Well, you uh, you enjoy those tasty burgers in my absence. I'm getting hungry. I had to skip lunch to bring on our CME hot seat guest in a little bit. So uh, y- those burgers are sounding better to me by the moment, sir. So if I start gnawing my arm in the middle of the show, that's uh, that's why. Well, you're in, you're in you're in Washington D.C. So why don't not, why not stop for a burger at a famous place called the Capitol Grill? I mean, not a not a bad stop for, and they got they actually got a nice burger at the bar there. Oh, yeah. I never thought of them as a burger player. You know, a steak, obviously. I've never gone there for a burger. Maybe I should reconsider my preconceived notions, sir. I'm telling you, it's, it's not a bad lunch. <laughs> All right. Maybe after this, I'm going to head out into it. Let's dive right into it. Let's break it down first. What's moving and shaking here for the week? Crazy week in the broad equity space, which is why I'm glad we got Sean on here to join me again today. Crazy week pretty much across uh, the markets. Let's break down the top five movers and shakers out here in CME land this week. By the way, you guys, as always, can play along with the home game. CMEgroup.com slash TWIFO, T-W-I-F-O. That's the place to go to kick the tires and light the fires over there. You can see all these reports, including this moving and shaking here, market scan report. And if you did that, make sure you set the adjustment back to get the, the date range for this week here for the show. If you did that, you'll see, let's start off on a positive note. Let's go to the upside first. Number five here on the upside chart, we got our old friend, Class 3 Milk, up about three and a quarter percent. Not exactly a huge option story there, but I know, I know you guys like to send in your, your, your questions and your snotty marks about dairy every now and then. So that'll please a few of you out there seeing class three milk on the list. Number two, number four, I should say, iron ore up 3.8%. Another one you guys have written in about it has been moving. The underlying shows no lack of activity. It's just not really as, as we've explored before. Again, another one, not a huge option story out there, unfortunately. Corn number three, four and a quarter percent. Interesting one. It's been on our tape a lot lately. We've been talking a little more ags out here of late. Maybe I'll have a chance to get some more in a little bit here. We'll see. Like I said, our special guest coming up in a little bit. Number two, oats up six and about six and a quarter percent this week. Good week for oats. And number one, the old euro dollar, eight and a third percent on the upside there. Big move out there in the euro dollar. To the downside, we've got number five, number five, good old Arbob gas off nearly four percent, three point eight percent. Number four, nat gas up about 4.4%. A lot going on in the energy space this week. Number three here to the downside, platinum. Platinum off 5.1%. Number two, WTI. Our old friend WTI having a rough week off about nearly 7%. And number one is Brent. Go figure, off 10.8% here. So not a bad week here. And just energy in general. Feeling some heat there. But before we get to energy, since we got you on here, Mr. Sean, it's a crazy week in your neck of the woods as well out here in all things equity land. You know, we saw kind of the end of last week, right after our show, Sean, we had all the crazy announcements coming out of the administration about trying to delist international names and ADRs and remove them from indices. Maybe let's start there because we talked to you before all that news kind of broke. Obviously, FTSE Russell very domestically focused. Was that an, any driver for activity for you this week? Were people calling you up saying, hey, I'm, I'm kind of I'm sick of all this madness with the macro international stuff. What can I get on the domestic small cap side? Has that been a driver of business for you guys this week? It's definitely been uh, a topic of discussion. You know, I don't get those kinds of questions, but I'm sure that our index folks in New York and in uh, Seattle do. Um, I'm, I'm sure that there were lots of phone calls uh, but as you know, our, our Russell 2000 small caps are are pretty much insulated from that being uh, the majority of the domestic stocks. So um, quite an interesting uh, index for, for folks to look at. And uh, frankly speaking, volumes have just uh, kind of popped on both CBOE and CME Group. Russell 2000 uh, futures just yesterday traded, uh, I want to say, 20, 30 percent higher volume than the average daily volume. So it's uh, um, definitely, definitely getting the. It's also due to market volatility as well. Um, but as as you know, open interest is that indicator of an anchor, and, and open interest stays strong at both uh, uh, clearing at SIBO and uh, at CME Group. So um, very excited about the strong open interest. Very excited about the the, the nice strong healthy volume. It's uh, it's actually good. Um, 
again, investors want the market to go up, but traders like volatility in the markets when it's healthy volatility. And I think we're there. Yeah, I think you're definitely right. Talking about this strong opening activity, I'm here glancing at the Russell 2000 options here. I don't know what you did in New York, Sean, but it certainly seemed to resonate. Either that or maybe us chatting about these options so often here on the show is having its desired effect. Either way, uh, someone putting up some numbers here this week. Once again, there seems to be definitely a, a core interest in the Russell 2000 options, at least looking here, the ones going up on Globex here on CME. A pretty big 2000 lot, once again, of the DEES Far out of the money puts, 1385 puts. Coming into Showtime, listeners, we're seeing the Russell off, obviously, on the week, about 2.3%. So at about a 1488. So these are roughly 100 handle out of the money puts in Dece. That's kind of been a theme we've seen pretty much throughout the year, Sean. When we see the big prints going up in the Russell options over here on the CME side, at least, it's definitely someone playing almost exclusively. It's opening like it was this week, and it's pretty far out, pretty far out of the money puts. It's a strange thing, but certainly someone seems to like playing there, Mr. Mr. Sean. Have you noticed that as well? Yes, and uh, it, it probably followed my guidance of buy puts when you can, not when you have to, uh, kind of advice there. <laughs> there you go. See, it was all you there, sir. Uh, but yeah, you know, it's been interesting to see just how, how consistent this paper is. When we see the big prints in the Russell options on CME, I almost always know, okay, I guess it's probably pretty far out of the money puts. Let's break down what's going on from a vol perspective out here as well, because it has been kind of a an interesting week, uh, to say the least. We talked about the movers and shakers out here. Let's look into what's been lighting it up. The vol, obviously, we saw... Big tumult earlier in the week, a big sell-off, VIX, VIX Cash crossing the 20 handle for the first time in a while, uh, getting up to about 21, almost 21 and a half on Wednesday. RVX also ticking up. VIX coming in a bit today, so it's down about a 19 and a half. That puts it up about three points from last week. Uh, RVX not really coming in as much. It's still up about nearly 22, 2190 or so right now. That puts it up nearly a handle from last week. So we got RVX up, VIX off a little bit, but still up net on the week, up three points. So that spread has tightened and tightened markedly. It was over four handles last week. Now it's about 2.4, almost two and a half out there. So a much tighter spread, Sean. That's an, I know that's another key data point we look at here a lot. And clearly that spread tightened it up. So maybe that's another reason why we saw those puts firing off this week. Because it does seem like whenever that spread either gets extremely wide or extremely tight, is when we start seeing some interesting paper on both sides of the fence. Is that what you see as well, sir? Uh, yes, sir. And, uh, uh, you know, historically, Russell 2000 is a, uh, obviously a more volatile index, uh, bringing volatility, implied vols into the, into the options as well. So it makes total sense to me. And by the way, Sean, you will be happy to know I had a chance down here at this market structure conference to get some time with another exchange that begins with C and ends with E, ironically. And I did put in a good plug or two for our old friend RVX to make a return. Uh, so hopefully, and they seemed, they seemed fairly receptive to the idea. So uh, perhaps we will be seeing our old friend RVX, I'm not going to say in the next few months, but maybe, maybe sooner than we, than we all initially assumed. So what do you think about that, sir? I mentioned it last week. It, it's, it's all about client demand. So thanks for doing that. We, we, need, uh, we need more of the, the, the folks on this show to, to reach out to Rick Rosenthal and the, and the other folks at SIBO uh, to, to bring that, that futures contract back. And uh, I'm excited. Uh, I'm excited about the increased volumes and uh, the increased focus on, on small caps as, uh, as the uh, index and strength and powerful index that it is. Um, so, uh, yeah, just keep the momentum going and let's, get, let's bring those futures back. Yeah, you know, it, it's, uh, it doesn't matter what you trade out there in the vol space. I think everyone wants to see more products out there to trade and to analyze. And it's nice having RBX disseminated, so at least you get that data point out there. But it would be nice, obviously, to be able to, to sink your teeth into the futures and options again, listeners. So hopefully we get that stuff back and listed because that would certainly be... Certainly be an interesting one for all of you guys I know to sink your teeth into. Speaking of interesting one to sink your teeth into, I touched at the top of the show there uh, what's going on from a energy perspective, energy dominating the downside of our bottom five this week, including our old friend WTI. You know, WTI kind of came in, broke the 56 handle to the downside earlier in the week, and then never really looked back. 
It's kind of been all downside all the time. Coming into showtime here, we're seeing our old friend WTI at about 52.5. That puts it off about 3.5 handles or nearly yeah, about 6% here on the week. 6.15% again, that's why it's in the bottom half of our Bottom of our top five, actually. Uh, so a rough week out here. Vol actually up, kind of mixed up across the board. Kind of depends where you're looking on the term structure out here. Uh, the active contract actually was the Dece contract with nearly 40% of the paper. The big print out here looks like it was a pretty close battle, but it was the 65 calls out here in Dece doing the lion's share of the paper, about 18000 and change. The lion's share coming actually yesterday, 9700 uh, so when we saw some movement there, we saw some about 10,000 contracts going up out there on those 65 calls. So interesting paper, pretty decently out of the money as well, about 10 handles or so. Those were actually opening, which is kind of interesting. So net opening about 2,100 on the week. Uh, some active upside here in WTI. I know you guys are all talking about SKU. You want to know about SKU. So before we get to our CME group hot seat guest in a little bit, let's look at some SKU out here in, uh, in WTI land. And looks like the puts are actually coming in a little bit. They're about 4% rich the at the money. This week, they're about 3.1%. So having, having come in a little bit, not quite as bit as they were, and the calls are actually on. I'm looking in the Dece contract, by the way, here, listeners. This is Dece, so this is obviously where the lion's share of the trading was this week. Uh, the calls were 1.1% cheap to the at the money this week. They're about 1% cheap. So not a lot of movement in those calls. I know last week we thought maybe the worm was turning. Maybe we saw some signs of that. Not so much of the follow-up here this week, listeners. Uh, uh, Sean, I'm going to cheat and bump up one listener question because we had someone send this in for last week's show, and we didn't get a chance to talk about it. But this is uh, an old saw, unfortunately, in the world of derivatives. It's the old, quote-unquote, rogue trader Dennis Dennis Till wrote this in saying, do you guys see this? Looks like someone got caught betting against that call skew. And the headline was, Rogue Oil Trader Crosses $320 million Loss at Mitsubishi Corp. And they take him out and said in their Singapore unit, a trader lost $320 million in unauthorized transactions disguised as quote-unquote legitimate hedges uh, for customers. It was a Chinese national and uh, let's see, the, and they are talking about the, the bad bets that they, they quote-unquote, disguised uh, to look like hedges. They say, actually, the interesting article here, I encourage you to check it out, talking about the history of, there's a decent history, actually, of rogue traders in the oil space, which is kind of interesting. Uh, a German firm lost $1.2 billion in 94 when they had an actually legit hedging strategy, at least an attempt at it, blow up in their face. Uh, Chinese aviation oil, 2004, lost nearly $600 million. Uh, when they also had some issues around hedging. Uh, but, but, Sean, this is kind of an old-school uh, trick in the derivative space. You know, take these bets you're making, and it uh, looks like this guy was maybe doing the old bet again of uh, blasting out some out-of-the-money puts, and it went against them. So what do you do? You put it in the customer account, right? That's what the old Nick Leeson trick. He did that at Bearings. He was selling a bunch of straddles and short puts and everything else, and he put those in the customer account to kind of hide them, right? The error account, I think it was. Uh, so this is an old trick. Unfortunately, Sean, though, I think we've seen it rear its ugly head again here in the derivatives, in the, I should say in the, in the oil space, but it's kind of an old repeated offense here in the derivative space. You've seen a few rogue traders in your time, have you not? I've been, uh, been around since the 80s, so yeah, most of them. So uh, at least uh, um, from, from the late 80s through today, so... Um, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, there's there's still tricks of the trade and people figure out ways to uh, to do that. But you know, uh, I'm all about customers having uh, safety and uh, soundness and confidence in our markets. And um, it's unfortunate that uh, uh, these things occur. But uh, we have protections in place, and our regulators, along with our exchanges, have uh, really done a really good job of stepping up. Uh, surveillance and, and ways to uh, catch um, uh, stuff going awry, not only, uh, uh, you know, people behaving badly, but also uh, to protect our customers and protect our clearing members as well. So um, uh, unfortunately, there's, there's, there's just some that uh, still get through somehow. And uh, um, it, our markets are, are better than they've ever been before uh, in terms of uh, safety and, and and soundness and security and uh, we, we we should uh, we should applaud our exchanges and our regulators for that today. But again, yeah, every once in a while they get through. 
it's unfortunate. You know, Sean, I guess I can't get too mad at uh, the rogue traders and things like that because it was actually Nick Leeson who brought me to the dark side of derivatives. I remember when that scandal was breaking, uh, I was still in college, and that was all the rage. And I was looking at jobs and finance, and everyone seemed terrified of these derivatives things. <laughs> and I thought, hey, if everyone's terrified of them because of this guy who made this crazy, this crazy mess, this debacle, I should at least learn what they are. So I, I could talk about them coherently in an interview. So that was my strategy. I would take a class in them to, to learn what the hell these things are. And all of a sudden, I got fascinated. And then go figure. Here we are talking on a radio network 20-odd years later all about those options things. So I guess in a weird way, Sean, we have it all to blame at, uh, at the feet of these rogue traders, sir. Yes, sir. It, it's unfortunate, as, as I said. Um, uh, but, yeah, it brings attention to the markets. It, it uh it uh, teaches lessons, you know, every time there's, there's a, a step back with an event like this, I think there's three steps forward with, with uh, a stronger education and awareness to how to prevent these from happening again. So um, let's just, uh, let's just uh, applaud our, our regulators and our exchanges and let's, uh, let's keep moving forward and try to uh, do our best to keep these markets and uh, strong and healthy and uh, a good experience for our, for our customers and all that are in the markets. Well said, sir. And, you know, we, we listen here. We like to listen to you guys here on the TWIFO program. You guys have written in. I even mentioned, Sean, I, I ran into a listener recently who's a pretty active trader in the ag markets. And a lot of people have been asking for more in the way of ags, in particular corn. So never let it be said that we ignore your queries and your requests here on TWIFO. There's a corn moving this week, so it seems justified. Let's get really quickly into corn before i got to toss it to myself and our CME Group Hot Seat guest here this week. Uh, corn, like I mentioned, up pretty strong. It's in our top five this week, up about 4.5% coming into the latter portion of the show here. That puts it up about nearly 20 handles, about 17 handles at 388 and a quarter or so. This part of showtime, uh, so we're looking at around the, the 390 strike for our at the money. Uh, we're seeing vol also up pretty firm here across the board, up about a point to about half a point, depending on where you're looking on the term structure. The lion's share of the paper out here in Dece, that's probably to be expected, about 51 a little over 51%. And the big print out here, again, probably not a surprise given what we're seeing out here. Those 400 calls, those par calls, doing the lion's share of the business, 25,500 dominating the tape this week for number one with the bullet. Pretty active throughout the week. The big days coming on Tuesday with about 8,400 and Monday, 7,400. Pretty much well, a good chunk of that opening there as well. So back and forth, but bias towards the opening here on those 400 calls. So it makes sense as we're surging towards that 400 level, we'd see some opening paper on that 400 call side. Not exactly, uh, not exactly too surprising there. there. Like I mentioned, the, the vol is up. Let's look here at the skew really quickly. You guys, of course, can look at the skew for yourself, cmegroup.com slash twifo. Seeing looks like puts getting a little bit of a lift this week. They were 6% cheap. At the moment, this week, about 3.5% cheap. So getting a little bit more bid. It's still cheap, but uh, getting a little bit more bid. Again, so moving up a little bit, seeing that skew rotate. That kind of makes some sense. The calls were 8 almost 9% Rich to the at the money last week. This week, 2.8%. So calls coming in, skews, or skews, put, puts coming up. Easy for me to say. Calls coming in. That's kind of be expected as you move up the curve a bit. You're going to see that skew kind of rotate. You should see the call wing come in. All things being held equal, you know, not seeing a giant jump in vol, which we didn't see a huge jump in vol. So it could be a bit of a move, but not a ton. So the skew curve didn't really shift so much as you kind of just slide in along it here this week. So there you go. A little bit of a, little bit of a taste of all things ags here for you. All right, let's go really quickly to some more listener listener mail here before we got to jump to our hot seat guest here, uh, Sean. Um, let's see, really quickly. Actually, there's one right, right up your alley, Sean, before we get out of here. Uh, it's on, uh, it's, it's comes from <laughs> El Doctoro. I like the handle. Uh, he says, it seems like when a company from the Russell 1000 moves into the Russell 2000, its stock price rises. Is that true? If so, if so, why? Uh, what happens when a stock moves the opposite way? And then he puts a link to some research uh, he has here that he, I, haven't, I have not had a chance to check out his research, listeners. Uh, but there you go. Mr. Sean, is that, is that something you've noticed anecdotally as well? When they move from the 1000, which is effectively the Russell version of larger cap, into the 2000, which is the smaller cap, it's price rises. Are you on board with that? What was that guy's handle? Because 
I'm like smiling right now thinking, I'm thinking to myself, you know, once you make it to the Russell Index family, I see it as a, a bullish for your stock to be recognized from a market cap perspective. But to, to go from the one large cap into the two, which is small cap, meaning your market cap has gone down, you know what it does? It probably brings attention to your stock, number one. And number two, you know, folks then now pay attention to what that company does and how they uh, generate revenue and, 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 and do the analyst type of analysis of a stock. And I can see sometimes it makes sense, but then other times I, I, I have to, I have to uh, put my thinking cap on and take a look at that. That's the, uh, your, your, your customer just gave me some, some homework. I'm going to take a look at that and probably get back to you in a couple of shows as to uh, reaction to the movement from one index to the other. And I'm going to go both ways on that. And I'll go from, from the two, to the one and from the one back to the two and uh, uh, see see what the, the analysis is there. I'm sure our uh, our folks at uh, FTSE Russell have, have watched that closely and I'll, I'll be reporting back on it. But great question. Yeah, that's interesting. You know, I, he actually included uh, included a link here to some research, Sean. I, if you, you can look at the notes, or I'll send you the link. You can check it out for yourself. It's to a study by the National Bureau of Economic Research, and it's entitled "Stock Price Reactions to Index Inclusion." <laughs> so, so very, uh, very straightforward title. And the headline is: When a company from the Russell 1000 just makes it into the Russell 2000, its share price rises compared to that of a company that narrowly missed making it in. And the reverse move triggers a stock price decline. That is, that is strange. That's kind of counterintuitive. You would think the opposite, right? You would think moving from the 1,000 larger cap into the small cap would be a sign of a price decline, right? Or a market cap decline. But uh, yeah, it's, a, it's a lower market cap, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's an int- I would never have guessed that. But, you know, the, the, the Russell 2000 index is more volatile and, and, and rally strong and had a great performance, three quarters of... 2018 before you know Q4 of last year uh, outperformed every index out there. So um, I, I have to say I'm 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 not surprised by the statistic, but I really want to check out those numbers. Really interesting anecdote from your uh, uh, from your customer. So I'm looking forward to looking at that and that I, I'll take that link from you as well, and I'll take a look and report back. But uh, our, our audience on the cutting edge here, Sean, of economic research. That's why I love them. They keep us on our toes. You know, they always have curveballs. They want, they want corn. They have crazy nuggets about footsie Russell region. Who knew? That's why I love hearing from you guys. Keep those questions coming. We love to hear from you guys. And if Sean, maybe they want to reach out to you directly with this stuff. Maybe they have questions about footsie Russell. Maybe they want to see some of the other research and data you guys have. Uh, where should they go? What should they do? Oh, come right to me, S. Smith, like my name, Sean Smith, S. Smith at FTSERussell.com. Happy, happy to, to uh, converse over email. Um, and then you get my email address. I'll, I'll share my phone number. We, we can hop on the, on the phone and, and have some discussion. But always, always uh, welcome interaction with clients. So um, you're welcome to reach out to me, and I look forward to that. There you go. Check them out. FTSERussell.com is the place to go. Also, give them a follow on the old Twitters. At FTSE Russell, F T S E Russell.com is the place to go. Meanwhile, we have to go on into our next segment. It's time for me to toss to myself how meta is that as we head on into our CME group hot seat conversation here on Twifo. Welcome back to Twifo. If we sound a little bit different, it's because we are joining you not from our studio here in Chicago, but from scenic and indeed sunny, quite sunny, actually, unseasonably so. Washington, D.C. for the Securities Traders Association Market Structure Conference. You know what that means, listeners, we're bringing on a great slew of guests. It's another conference, another string of guests. And who should I run into down here at STA Conference, of all things, but our old friend, Mr. Derek Salmon, pretty much the head of all things options over there at CME Group. Derek, welcome back to TWIFO. Uh, first off, 
what are you doing down here in D.C., Derek? You're probably the last guy I expected to run into here. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. Well, I heard it was going to be 95 degrees here, so I got, got out of Chicago. You had to for yourself, yes. 60 and rainy. It was a nice alternative. No, this is, uh, you, you rightly pointed out, this is the first time CME Group has been involved in this conference. Uh, very excited to be here. Um, you know, as we continue to grow our options business, specifically globally, it continues to be an outsized driver of growth for CME Group, not just in equities, but cross-asset class. Uh, we're just finding ourselves expanding our dialogue across the broader swath of capital markets participants. And as futures on options become a, bar, a, a larger part of the overall pool of options trading, it seems a natural for us to be here and be engaging with the folks that are specifically in equity options, but talking you know, about energy options and agricultural options, fixed income options. We heard a lot about the fixed income ETF market growth yesterday, and uh, fixed income is, is a thing these days. So we wanted to uh, both uh, be as part of a broader dialogue across the option space and uh, no better place to uh, run into the movers and shakers of securities industries than this conference here in D.C. this week. It makes total sense that you guys would be here. I mean, how often have you and I been talking for years now, Derek, and how much of that conversation is equity options and all the things going on therein? So it makes a lot of sense that you guys would be here. I'm, I'm glad you guys finally made it happen. No, we appreciate that. And uh, had some really interesting conversations yesterday and looking forward to the rest of the uh, conference today. And a lot of sidebars in terms of, you know, what's happening in futures options and where the growth's coming from. We actually wrapped up uh, through the first three, first three quarters of this year, our options volume is up 11%. Futures volume is up 5 or 6%. So we continue to see our options franchise outpace growth of underlying futures and be that additive marginal growth for us. So uh, and what's interesting is, Mark, we're seeing the, the bulk of our growth come from our metals options are up year to date. We're up 45%. Fixed income is up 25%. Equities down a little bit, tracking what we're seeing from some of the equities exchanges. But, uh, you know, when you look at overall, the, uh, the 4.3 million contracts a day we're putting up across these six asset classes continues to be both an area of growth and differentiation as folks are looking to, you know, get access to beta and different asset classes. We, you know, we're the place that folks can do that. Not surprising the metals would be lighting it up these days. It's been on this program. It's been a, a hot topic for, I'd say, the better part of the year. And obviously, as the equities have been topsy-turvy, as volatility has returned, people like their flight to quality assets, and they don't, then they like them again. And so that makes, uh, makes for a good setup for a lot of options trading. So it doesn't surprise me, Derek, that, that maybe metals would be leading the conversation over there these days from an options perspective. Yeah. Hey, listen, it's all about gold right now. You know, whether you're concerned about uh, deflation or inflation or the real commodities risk that's out there, um, gold absolutely has a shine right now to the extent that gold bugs are uh, popping around lots of different theories about what's actually going on in the physical market. We are seeing a significantly increased participation uh, across our franchise. I mean, year to date, 45% growth. That's for the full year. Um, if you look at just the, the second quarter, uh, our metals business is up 83%. In September alone, our options business is up 96%. So um, we're and I think that's actually linked to the success we're having in globalizing participation in our markets as well. When you look across the, uh, you know, that 11% growth uh, for full year today, when you actually break that down, our, our Asian business volumes are up 39%. European volumes up 22%. Our U.S. business and our kind of most mature part of the franchise up 5%. So as you keep hearing us say, as we continue to globalize markets, light up electronic markets in options cross time zone, um, that liquidity effect is bringing spread crossers along. And we're seeing that now in some of the smaller asset classes like metals see that outpace growth as you're seeing some pretty volatile moves. I mean, look, gold sat between 1150 and 1300 for like three years. We broke out and we've seen people participate in that using options. What a terrific risk management tool that is. And I think the global market with the distribution we've got in Globex is really proving that to be a great way to get access to these markets. That would make sense that we would have some cross-time zone action in those markets because so many of the precipitating events that have been driving action in the metals and indeed the broad equities have been trade war related. A lot of that coming from across the pond, shall we say. Uh, so not exactly in U.S. trading hours. So it would make sense that we're seeing a lot of globalization following along that paper. You know, interesting on the metals side too, because uh, gold gets all the headlines. That's where the lion's share of the volume is. But if some other metals have been peeking in there of late. I've, in fact, I can't recall the last time we talked this much silver on the TWIFO shows we have over the last couple of months. Silver hasn't been a huge option story, but that's starting to change a little bit. We're seeing more volume, more growth, certainly more interest anecdotally from our audience, you know, what's going on out there in, in silver. So it's nice for me. I, like, I can talk gold. I know Nick loves to talk gold, but uh, it's nice to have a few other metals peeking in there every now and then, Derek. Yeah, it is. And I would say the overall precious metals story, you could throw platinum and palladium in there as well. We've set multiple records from volume, open interest, participation 
participation, globalization as well. It's just that gold, you know, is that, that older sibling that just tends to get the lion's share of the feedback. What is interesting, Mark, though, is we're actually seeing um, the investments we've been making in electronifying our copper options market, the old industrial metals of, of copper, certainly with the China story being what it is and global growth being, being in question right now, um, you know, the copper options market has been historically small and relatively brokered, so not a very electronic market. Um, our business in, in copper is literally off the charts, like, you know, triple-digit growth. It's a very small base, but we're setting um, all-time record this year in copper options. That it's only 3,000 contracts a day, but that's up from about 200. that's enormous, right? <laughs> that's up from it's about 200 contracts a day uh, on our exchange just 18 months ago. And we're, we're seeing the benefits of being able to put lit markets out there into European and Asian trading zone. Um, and that's the benefit of being a multi-asset class exchange. We're investing in underlying technology and infrastructure across six asset classes. So that 4.3 million contracts we're doing every day benefits not just our euro dollar options and treasury options and WTI options, but the smaller, more niche markets like copper options, for example. And helping that market grow substantially electronically, we know what electronic fund market does. Adds participation, tightens bid-ask spreads, deepens book, adds liquidity, and brings access to those markets across time zones. We're seeing that. Um, it, it's a heavy lift percentage-wise. It's a, a relatively small number in the grand scheme of things, but structurally what that means to bring more participants in and electronify those markets is the story of how we've grown that market. So we're really excited about what we're seeing there. That first few thousand is probably a lot harder than the, the next 10 or 20 or 50,000, I would imagine. Getting those people online, getting them open to, like you said, it's a mostly brokered market ahead of that, so getting them open to trading that way is probably the, the heavy lift there. And once they get a few hundred, a few thousand up, the next 10 or 20,000, that's probably, probably a much easier do. No, I think that's right. And, you know, we, we see this cross-asset class. I mean, just shifting to fixed income a little bit, you know, obviously treasuries and euro dollars are going to be a big part of what we do. What we've seen is actually an explosion in our Fed funds options, right? Now that there's actually volatility in the short end of the curve and reversal of Fed governor's positions, we're actually seeing that uh, we're seeing a significant pickup in Fed funds options. Haven't seen that for a couple of years. So, you know, it's about having the right portfolio of products, having the delivery, the liquidity, the global access, the distribution, and the client participation so that, you know, as either uh, structural, uh, you know, sector shifts into or out of asset classes happens, and if it's challenging in equities, we've got five other asset classes for markets to participate in. That's why we're seeing such substantial growth overall, yet the bulk of that is being really led by, uh, by metals and fixed income. The other businesses are down slightly or kind of flattish. But, you know, customers want to be able to add an increasing number of options products to their overall uh, portfolios, and we're just a terrific way to play that for them. Yeah, fixed income, you know, for the longest time on this program and others on the network, you know, rates was – it was kind of a, shall we say, a boring complex. There wasn't a lot going on. Fed wasn't doing anything. Rates weren't doing anything. There wasn't a lot of interest or action in, uh, in the rate side of the space. And all of a sudden, the last year and change, you know, Fed started perking up. The curve started lighting, of course, the inversion – that drove everyone crazy. <laughs> and all of a sudden, for a while there, the rates have been the hot thing. In fact, we had a guest come on not too long ago, jokingly give me a hard time about how we don't do enough rates on the program. I, t- I told them quite truthfully, the reason we don't, A, it's funny because both Sean and Nick are, are old school euro dollar guys, yet getting them to talk euro dollars is like pulling teeth. So that, that's one of the challenges. But also, B, a product like euro dollars, it does so much of the volume, right? And I think for a lot of the audience, it is so much volume, and it is such a monster of a product with the different colors and the months. And it, it's almost overwhelming to them. So being able to find a way to communicate that in a way that's intuitive and bite-sized enough for them to intuit in five or ten minutes is sometimes a bit of a challenge. So, yeah, I mean, Eurodollars has been, I'm sure, dominating your tape again this year, sir. Yeah, it really has. I mean, to the extent that, it, listen, it's been a terrific year in options. I think we're certainly, when we look across the kind of other venues where options are traded, we're, we're significantly outperforming, you know, our, our global peers out there in terms of what other uh, venues customers have to choose from. And along the way, we set, we've set, I mean, got our Q2, you know, normal summer months, normally kind of slow. We set um, an all a second all-time volume record, 4.3 million contracts traded in the second quarter. Second quarter. That includes months like July. I mean, these are, these, these are slow historical months for that second all-time volume month for us. And, and as importantly, I'll throw a couple of stats here. We had a record day on June 3rd of 10.8 million contracts. You know, compare that to the 4.3 we're doing uh, on an average day, 10.8 million contracts. You can imagine, Mark, a good chunk of that is fixed income. Finally, all-time open interest, 98.2 million contracts, options open interest. We have been growing that options open interest number monthly for three years. 
It is unbelievable. And again, a big chunk of that, given the maturities and the kind of the 40 expirations in, in euro dollars, a big chunk of that is fixed income. A big chunk of that is euro dollars. So, you know, the growth we put into weeklies, the, the, the weekly Wednesdays, weekly Fridays across equities, across FX, fixed income, energy, um, customers want and need these granular points on the curve. And then we're seeing not just volume growth, but open interest records and broadening participation. That's Those, to us, are the metrics of a successful, healthy, growing market. Let's talk about the participation for a second. I'm kind of curious because, obviously, Eurodollar is a big, meaty, beefy, institutionally oriented product. And it's a challenge for us on the content side to to convey that to a retail audience. I'm curious for you guys. Have you seen an uptick in – because I know there's a lot of – we hear it anecdotally. There's enough enough active end of the retail space. Who could understand it if if they can come to grips with it? Have you seen some growth for that product and that audience as well? Uh, we are. We're, we're actually seeing the biggest growth over the course, and this is full year um, 2019 to date. So this is through end September. Our buy side client volume is up 29 percent. Buy side. That's everybody: hedge fund, asset manager, pension fund, insurance company. You know, long only guys, um, guys that are either trend followers or customers that have underlying exposures that they need to cover. Um, 29 percent growth. Uh, we're seeing our banks business up 12 percent. Um, you know, a lot of people think that a lot of our volumes is, is simply proprietary or given. They're, they're not our fastest driver. They're not even our second two fastest driver. Um, and if we were um, to look at the spread of that open interest, you know, props are in and out. We are seeing participants carry, and this is the, the point I made before, 98.2 million contracts open interest in options of the 150 that we have. Two-thirds of that is in options. So um, not a surprise to see buy-side participation up, not a surprise to see banks up, given the rise in uh, volume and participation in the fixed income markets. And actually, banks are a nice part of our growth story in, fi- in, um, in gold specifically. Uh, you know, and retail is coming along for the ride. Um, we are seeing greater levels of participation in retail than we've ever seen before. Uh, it, it's, it's a process. You know, options are a sophisticated risk management tool. So we spend a lot of time educating directly not just our end clients that we can touch, but working through our retail intermediary broker and distribution network to give them tools to train their customers up on trading options. So we're seeing that as a good long-trend growth trajectory as – directed, self-directed, sophisticated end-user retail customers are doing more in the option space. Very encouraging. Uh, but uh, we're just most pleased to see the buy side and, and bank uh, volumes lead uh, the growth story for us. That's very, very supportive of you know, our focus on the end-user customer in these markets. Speaking of volumes and quarters, I know it just ended, so I don't know if you have all the numbers at hand. But obviously, Q3, not always a hot time for the option space. August in particular is usually a time when everyone goes on vacation and there's the junior, junior, junior guy left manning the desk. Uh, and the retail is gone, too. So it's not usually a lot this year. There were things actually happening in August, volatility, some movement in the equities and the options. Any interesting anecdotes? I'm sure Q3, particularly August, probably far more active than you're used to seeing out there, Derek. Yeah, it was great to see. I mean, certainly for us to, to, to think that we're going to pack up and close up shop for the month of August, like that may have been true a couple of years ago. It's just markets don't take a day off anymore. How can you when, you know, you've got uh, presidential treats lighting markets up and you've got, uh, you know, there's just a lot of global stress right now. And, and we are a risk management firm that provides effectively insurance policies for our customers to use. So you'd expect in volatile times and uncertain geopolitical climates that you, you would see even in the summer months, volume's up. So if I look specifically uh, at the quarter, I'll refer to the, the monthly results. I mean, the September numbers for us were up 16% in options across the board. Metals led the charge with 96% growth. Um, fixed income was up 23%. Equities uh, up a couple of percent, uh, up 7%, I think. Um, and energy kind of flattish, and, and ags and FX were a little bit down year on year, not surprisingly given some of the summer fluctuations, and FX is going through a tough, low, volatile market right now. But the beautiful thing is, and we continue to talk about the ways in which we can provide risk management solutions in every asset class for customers, we got a couple of businesses that are flatter smalls down, yet the overall franchise is up 16%. So no matter what risk our customers are facing, be it fixed income equities, energy, eggs, metals, um, FX, we've got the deepest, most liquid electronic market for those customers to manage their risk. 23 and a half hours a day, five and a half days a week. And that's where that global growth story continues to be that marginal increase in participation both from client growth and from client volumes as well. Sounds like the growth story is continuing over there, uh, CME, from an options perspective. I'm curious, Derek, as we wrap it up here, any other interesting nuggets that are jumping off the chart at you? Or maybe you want to leave our audience 
a little bit of a hint, a little bit of a tease of what's to come. I know you already did the big tease a couple of weeks ago when we had the, the Bitcoin options. I already gave Demacord a hard time about missing our TWIFO prayer. I won't give you a hard time as well. So, so obviously that's a big tease. What else can listeners expect from CME on the options side in the coming months? Well, I think you're going to see us, you know, continue to, you know, continue to play on, on the theme of giving our customers more, uh, more flexibility, more points on the curve to trade. Uh, in fact, uh, Tom Boggs just reminded me that we've uh, extended the listings for our Mondays and Wednesday weeklies from two weeks to four weeks. So it's just additional points on the curve to trade very granular events, whether it's non-farm payrolls coming out tomorrow or whether it's, uh, you know, the GDP numbers. Every time we see the, the, the trade numbers, there's some sort of a market reaction because we seem to see more surprise. Than, uh, than, than near hits these days. So, um, you know, between those and the compression cycle runs that, you, that you've heard us talk about in equity options, uh, providing more services in more granular products in more effective ways for customers to manage their risk. And I think our volumes and our particular non-U.S. volume growth continues to support the, the, the path that we've been on in giving customers choice and, and letting them flexibly manage um, as many points on the curve within that same wonderful cross-margining pool that they've got access to by having it all inside the same clearinghouse. So we're excited about the customer growth. Um, this story never gets old, and we are not stopping to innovate in any of our asset classes. So it's been a lot of fun. Listeners can expect, then, daily equity options coming from CME. <laughs> is, that what you're, is that what you're hinting at here, Derek? Well, you already got weeklies extending out. <laughs> let's, just, let's just add them all. Let's go daily. Let's we go like to, we like to news here today. crawl before we walk, before we run. <laughs> so we're sort of in a, in a light jog right now, put it that way. But, uh, See, it's heading there. It does yeah. seem like it's heading that way, yeah. right? Yeah. It sounds like such a quaint notion now, expiration Friday, right? It's like that yeah. used to be a thing. It used yeah. to be a big thing. And yeah. now it's, oh, what, what, every Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, whatever. It has changed quite a bit. And I was joking before, only partly about the Bitcoin options, but how excited are you to finally have a listed option to be able to put under your purview in the crypto realm? Finally, Derek, it's finally yeah. here. You know, listen, I, I've been an option trader my whole life, and that's where I cut my teeth on the floor of the exchange back in the 90s with a, with a proprietary trading firm. And so I've, I've always been partial to... Um, using options as part of an overall portfolio. So I think to the extent that we needed to prove the value and the validity and the use case for Bitcoin futures in a regulated market, we've been very clear on what we believe that's done for the end user customer. And, you know, folks that want to be able to safely long and short the contract makes every sense in the world to then provide an option on the backup, but only once we felt there was sufficient liquidity in the future. Um, You know, our experience has really shown that trying to simultaneously launch options and futures, particularly in an emerging asset class like crypto, um, it presents certain challenges. So our idea was let's 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 learn from this community. Um, you know, get our toe in the water, regulate uh, this entity inside a CFTC jurisdiction, and then. F- suss out really what the client demand is and the kind of clients operating in that market. And we've seen that those clients very much are um, asking us to add options on top of to give them that additional dimension of risk management. Um, So we're very encouraged by that. So we're excited about it, but we just wanted to be very uh, cautious going in and not get over our skis. You know, we're learning from this community as we get more deeply in. So we think this is the good, cautious next step for us. So we're excited. And um, I'm sure Tim has uh, already heard from you multiple times about uh, the announcement time. I mean, <laughs> if ever there was a product class that needed some risk management, I think crypto is certainly the one. What, 20,000 to 3,000, back up to 14, now somewhere around 10 or below. I, I haven't checked it in the last few minutes. I'm sure it's moved 500 points. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it's, it has been fascinating to watch. So we'll look at That's Q1, correct? It is indeed, yeah. So we're excited about that. And here you'll be hearing more from us in terms of contract specs and specifications and, uh, and whatnot going forward. But it certainly generated good dialogue. And that's, you know, we, we did a lot of client validation going in before we decided this was the right thing to do. We don't take these decisions lightly. It taxes our customers, our clearing firms, uh, and our system, so we don't take these decisions lightly. So this is a good client validated next step, and we're excited to, you know, work with our customers and roll this out, and um, you know, take this next step in the maturation of what is effectively one of the newest asset classes out there. Well, Derek, I'm glad we could squeeze you in at an Equities Market Structure Conference. Who'd have thunk it? And I'm glad we'll get this look at what's going on to see me. We'll have to check back in with you with some more trends as we close out the year here, sir. Thanks so much, Mark. Have a good one. Appreciate it, and uh, try not to get too uh, fried in this 90 degree DC weather we're having this week. This Week in Futures Options is brought to you by QuickStrike, options pricing and analysis software. QuickStrike offers powerful and flexible options analysis and pricing tools via an easy-to-use web-based interface. View prices on outright options or spreads with comprehensive page-level analysis controls. Build trades, manage risk, or explore historical volatility. QuickStrike has you covered. 
with market data reports ranging from open interest to the term structure of volatility. Quick Strike is the perfect addition to your trading toolkit. Learn more about Quick Strike at Bantix.com. That's B A N T I X.com. And don't forget to follow us on Twitter at Quick Strike One. That's Q U I K S T R I K E One. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by CME Group, the world's leading and most diverse futures and options exchange. CME Group's markets help individuals and businesses around the world manage risks and seize opportunities. CME Group offers the deepest and most liquid options on futures across all asset classes, including interest rates, equity indexes, foreign exchange, energy, agriculture, and metals. For more information and educational resources about futures options at CME Group, visit cmegroup.com slash options. This Week in Futures Options is also brought to you by FTSE Russell, a leading global provider of benchmarks, analytics, and data solutions. Investors in the U.S. and around the world are using FTSE Russell indexes to benchmark their investment performance and create investment funds, ETFs, structured products, and index-based derivatives. Many Options Insider Radio Network listeners will be familiar with the Russell 2000 Index. Russell 2000 Futures and Options are currently trading on the Chicago Board Options Exchange and CME Group. For more information, please visit FTSERussell.com, CBOE.com, and CME Group. Com. This broadcast is intended for informational and educational purposes only and does not constitute trading advice or the solicitation of purchases or sale of any futures or options. The rulebook of the applicable exchange should be consulted as the authoritative source on all current contract specifications. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. 